And now we're going to uh, listen uh, about the uh, uh, amazing technology that uh, Google is using for understanding kernel scheduling. And with this, uh, let's transition to Lee's presentation. Hi, I'm Lee Ba from Google, and I'd like to present a tool for visualizing kernel scheduling behavior that we've recently open sourced. It's called Skedviz. But first, I'd like to talk a bit about kernel scheduling. Thread scheduling is a logistical problem. In modern machines, there are a lot of cores, but there are far more threads that want to run on those cores, so they have to share. Often that's fine, but sometimes, particularly in the kinds of servers that we all work on, it's a source of performance problems. Here we have an overtime view of which threads are running where on a two core machine. In this view, time is increasing to the right. We have five threads that all want to run, so they have to timeshare. Each thread gets to run for a little while and then has to wait while other threads get to run. And because we have multiple cores, the threads are free to move around to help relieve the pressure. You can see the green thread, thread 300, doing that here. Fair sharing seems like a good approach, but arguably fairness isn't really what we want here. First, not all threads are equally important. Some threads just have to always be running. For instance, low level network services. Some threads don't need to be running all the time, but do need to be really responsive when they do want to run, like rendering threads. Not all cores are equal. Even if we set aside exotic heterogeneous architectures, which honestly are becoming less exotic, <clears throat> most servers have multiple NUMA nodes. And that means that threads running away from their home node will suffer increased memory latency. I'll go into more detail on that in a few slides. And finally, not all times are equal. Threads might want to sleep while waiting for some event and then need rapid servicing when that event happens and they wake up. And some threads at some times are on critical paths, whereas at other times they're not critical. So the scheduler's default behavior isn't always what we want. So what can we do about it? Well, actually quite a lot. C groups provide ways to cap resource usage and restrict groups of threads to particular cores. We can also pin threads to particular cores with set affinity. We can set relative thread priorities with nice. We can change scheduling policies with set adder. But this is a lot of really complex stuff, and it's all done at the thread or thread group level. And so understanding how it all comes together in a real system is really difficult. To make the most of these tools, we really need visibility into exactly how scheduling is happening. There are tools like TOP that provide aggregated statistics about thread scheduling. And things like that can be useful to discover when there's gross starvation happening. But that doesn't help us tease out why the starvation is happening. And it barely helps at all when critical but fine green deadlines are being missed. Rather than aggregate statistics or samples, what we really need is a trace of all of the scheduler's decisions. And we can get such a trace. Linux provides a hooking mechanism called trace points. Interesting places in the kernel or in driver code can provide a trace point hook, and then probe functions can later attach to those hooks. Those functions are then invoked and provided with some local context whenever that trace point is passed. Linux also provides a suite of predefined probes called ftrace that just emit the events and that context per to per CPU data buffers for later analysis. Now, I said that interesting places in the kernel are instrumented. A word about interesting here. Usually trace points are coincident with functions or kernel <coughs> APIs, and the context is the argument to those functions. Now, not all kernel functions are instrumented with trace points. Instead, the places most likely to be of interest in debugging or in performance tuning tend to be instrumented. For instance, when drivers change state, when syscalls enter or exit, when IRQs happen, when KVM decisions are made, and when scheduler decisions are made. In particular, there are four events that really help us here. Sched switch, that tells us when and where one thread yields to another. Sked wake up and its new variant, that tells us when threads become runnable. And finally, sked migrate task, that tells us when a thread is moved from one core to another core. So here's a sample of the kind of data that we get from ftrace. In this view, each event is on its own line and it has everything that we need, the cores, the timestamps, what threads were involved, their states, what event it was. A one second trace on a modern server might produce a couple of millions of lines like this. So we do have the data, but we still need a way to visualize it. And that's what Skedviz is for. This is the main trace view in Skedviz. 
On the left, we have a top-like list of threads and their aggregate statistics, how much time they ran and waited and slept and how many migrations they experienced and so forth. On the right, we have a heat map. This shows the system's cores as a set of horizontal swim lanes with time increasing to the right. And for each core, a schematic display of how loaded that core is and when and how many threads are waiting. This heat map supports panning, zooming, and filtering by core number, among other interactions. Here I've filtered it down to just one core. We can see that on the left-hand y-axis. And to just a small portion of the trace, we can see that in the minimap on the x-axis. Note that as we pan and zoom, that also filters down what we see in the left-hand thread pane. Each CPU swim lane consists of two areas. The top area shows what was running on that CPU. At the moment, it's showing CPU utilization in grayscale. Running intervals are shown as rounded pills, and that makes it clearer to see where they start and where they end. The CPU utilization pills convey two pieces of information. First, how busy the core was. This is represented by the height of the pills. If there's no pill at all, that means the CPU was totally idle. And also how much queuing that CPU was experiencing. This is represented by the brightness of the pills. Lighter pills, whiter pills mean more waiting. The bottom area <coughs> of the swim lane shows how many threads were queuing, that is waiting to run on the score. These are represented as teal rectangles and the taller they are, the more stuff is waiting. We can also select specific threads. We can do this either by clicking on them in the heat map or in the thread list. Groups of threads can also be selected and colored together. So here we can see that this K-worker thread, the one in magenta, was waiting to run for about six milliseconds. When we find a thread of interest, like this K-worker, we can expand it in the thread list to see more detailed information about it. By default, we get a view of the raw events that affected that thread. That's what's shown here. But we can also see a view of the antagonists that affected this thread. And this is the first pathology I want to talk about. An antagonism is an interval over which a victim thread is ready to execute, but is waiting while an antagonist thread runs instead. This can help give us a sense of where and how our scheduling configuration isn't really working the way that we want. Antagonisms are also really to see, easy to see in the heat map. Here, the blue thread is meant to have exclusive access to this core. By zooming and panning into the edges of the blue thread's running intervals, that's where the rounded edges of the pills come in, we can see what threads are stealing its work and for how long. Another common scheduling pathology is round-robin queuing. When two or more threads want to run all the time on a single core, they have to timeshare. And that means that each one gets a little slice of time on the core and then yields to the next thread. This produces a really distinctive candy stripe pattern in SCADVIS. Here on the bottom core, we can see a long interval of round-robin scheduling between the yellow and the blue threads. We can also see why this happened. We can see that the round-robin queuing began when the blue thread migrated onto the bottom core from the top core, and it ended when the yellow thread migrated out from the bottom core to the middle core, where it actually kicked off a different bout of round-robin queuing. I'll dive into one more pathology SCEDVIS can be used to explore, NUMA issues. As a quick reminder, NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access, and it refers to a class of modern multi-core architecture in which different groups of cores often a group is associated with a single chip, have their own local DRAM units so that all other DRAMs in the system are remote. This means that accesses to local memory are much faster than accesses to remote memory. So here in this view, we can see a yellow thread just hopping all around the system. About halfway through, it jumps from the top NUMA node to the bottom one. We can see that, we can see the system topology, which includes NUMA nodes on the right-hand y-axis. If NUMA node 0 was the yellow thread's home node, then after that migration, all of its memory accesses became considerably more expensive. For memory-intensive workloads, this can have a really significant performance impact. Now, the Linux scheduler's load balancer is hierarchical, so it does try to prefer moving threads around only in their local NUMA nodes, but that can lead us to another pathology. If too many threads are homed in one NUMA node, then that node can easily become overloaded relative to the other nodes. Here we can easily see that the top NUMA node is busy, even sometimes overloaded, while the bottom NUMA node sits almost entirely idle. These are three important pathologies, but they represent only a few of the kinds of issues we've been able to resolve with SCEDVIS. We'd like to invite you to learn more. There is a post about SCEDVIS in the Google Open Source blog, and there was a video there. 
<clears throat> and you can try it out yourself. Skedviz is available on GitHub. It's also an active development. We want to extend it to visualize more than just scheduling behavior. There are lots of trace points, and many of them are relevant to the kind of latency visualization that Skedviz does excel at. We also have other plans. Please ask me. Thank you. OK, uh, there is a, uh, a question in the Slack channel. Do you have any examples of issues that were solved with Skedviz? Uh, we absolutely do. Um, some of them are you know, pretty internal. But each of these pathologies that I, uh, that I went over in the talk uh, is representative of a kind of issue that we found in uh, uh, it, using Skedviz. So um, for example, we have, for several for several efforts at Google, done extensive massaging of exactly how we exactly how we set up the thread scheduler, uh, informed by information that we get from uh, uh, from from Skedviz. Uh, we have another I question. Always works on Android. I've never tried, but Android has trace points, and it's worked on everything that we've done that has trace points. So I bet it would. Uh, ad additionally, uh, this um, so the open source version of, of Skedviz is mostly built around using trace points. But if you can get the raw scheduling information somewhere, you can use that. So we have in the open source version a a very rough eBPF collector. Uh, which can generate uh, traces that Skedviz can load. Uh, so there's a completely different mode of collecting this data. The main thing is that you need to be able to get information about when, sched when threads are moving around and how they're moving around. Interestingly, we are going to have a talk about using eBPF on Android uh, later today. So hopefully, uh, there will be some uh, information that you can uh, ask from Reham because she definitely has a lot of experience uh, using um, MBPF on Android. And I would imagine that similar techniques to the ones that you use for sketch um, yeah. are probably applicable there as well. And uh, and a note, if, if for instance, you're interested in getting that going, and, and we have no, I, I know of no users for the uh, eBPF sort of client in, uh, in Skedviz. I just added it as a proof of concept, uh, but, if you wanted to get that going, I would I would love to uh, to OK push requests from you about that, and I don't think it would take too much work. Uh, awesome. Do you consider aggregating across different machines? Uh, not directly using the Skedvis tool, uh, and the main reason for that is that it takes a lot of overhead, a lot of uh, infrastructure to actually coordinate collections so that it's simultaneous across multiple machines. We do have a couple of places where, oh, the, <laughs> there's a second question, which is basically the same idea, or pretty close. Um, we do have a couple of places where we would like to see uh, simultaneous traces from two machines. For example, I'm in GCE, which, which does uh, um, uh, VMs, and we would like to see traces from inside the host as well as inside the guest simultaneously. Uh, we haven't really worked on visualizations for that, but there is, we have done a little bit of work to try to align the tracing at least. In terms of extending Skedviz to a cluster of machines, we actually have something internally that does do something like that. Uh, it's called the scheduling sampler. Uh, and it what it basically does is every day it takes a couple of maybe 12,000 traces on prod machines, just randomly. Like you're up today, you're going to get a trace right now. And then it does in bulk analysis exploration of those traces to try to find uh, a distribution of scheduling problems, and it also helps us find like real outliers. A lot of that is built on Google infrastructure, but there is there are some ingredients to it that I'm in the process of trying to open source. Uh, and, and of course, enterprises could could do their own version of that. Basically, you 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 would have to arrange for collections to be made across the uh, the fleet and stored somewhere. Uh, how many seconds of measurement do you need to produce meaningful results? Uh, you can get you can get traces that make sense for just a tiny fraction of a second, uh, but really it depends on the kind of performance issue that you're looking for. In my experience, thread scheduling born pathologies tend to manifest in the millisecond range. So 
if you've gathered five milliseconds, you're probably not going to have much confidence that anything you've seen is a problem. Uh, but our default collection duration is half a second to two seconds equable, and that's plenty, we find. Uh, have you considered visualizing trace diffs? Yeah, I have. Trace diffs are extremely hard. Um, the reason for that is that it's completely up to the operating system how it even schedules these things. So what is a diff, you know? Uh, com comparing a trace of thread movement on one machine to that on another machine, the two machines are different. So, uh, so diffing the actual trace, diffing the sequence of things that happened is, is really hard. Uh, you can absolutely diff aggregated metrics. So you can roll up, for instance, this kind of thread, antagonize that kind of thread this much time, and then you can diff those. But that's sort of one level removed from schedules. Uh, is there any impact to performance while collecting data? Yes, of course there is. Uh, collecting trace points does have a cost, and it is profoundly dependent on how frequently the trace points that you're collecting are emitted. Uh, and in the case of sked trace points, that relates to how um, how much scheduling thrash is happening. Uh, and uh, towards that, we have found inside of Google that for a lot of our common workloads on our machines, which of course will be different for everyone else, the overhead is something along the lines of 2% while you're tracing, which you trace for a second, so it's it's not that much intrusion. But if you are going for something that collects all the time, which we do, we do have some applications of, then you start to have to think about it. Uh, visualization is great, but also involves a lot of manual eyeballing. Do you have common patterns you could automate for detection? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I mentioned the scheduling sampler, and one of the components of the scheduling sampler is what are called analysis passes that do exactly that. They, they look at a given trace. Uh, Skedviz also has a, 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 a programmatic backend, so you can you can finalize a trace and ask all these questions about it without ever having to go through the UI. Uh, and, and that's what the scheduling sampler does. So it's trying to find all kinds of very, very specific uh, uh, performance issues automatically. All right. Uh, so I think we are out of time for the, for the Q&A section. Thank you I, so I, much. It was address amazing. In, um, in Slack. Yeah, please do so. Um, it looks like you have a lot of questions and I mean amazing text. Thank you so much for sharing about it, and I hope uh, to see uh, more news in the coming uh, event. Thanks for the opportunity, Teres.